once again welcome over in the, the venue. There's the venues packed full of, full of people. Most of you will recognize this, this guy up on, on the screen right here. Um, you know, you usually see him at a football game, you know, strategically placed in the end zone with some sort of banner or shirt, or you see him at a hockey game or maybe a, a basketball game, and, and he always kind of knows right where to get, so, so, so you, you see this, this John 3.16, and I don't know, 98.6% of you in this room know exactly what that is. It, it's a Bible verse. But, but there's a percentage of you in here, and you, you have no clue. You know, you've seen the guy, but, but you don't know what it means or what it says. And the reason why I know there are some of you who don't know what it means or what it says is because for a lot of years, I had no clue. I'd see this guy in the end zone. I'd see this guy on TV or whatever, and I just, I just thought that was John Madden's weight. <laughs> some, of you, some of you will get that on the way home. It'll, 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 if you're a football fan, you'll, you'll figure that out. But there came a moment when somebody uh, sat down with me and kind of unpacked this, this verse. It's, it's only 26 words, but those 26 words changed my life forever, literally, radically changed my life forever. Those 26 words changed most of your lives forever. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, last hour, uh, th there's been well over 100 people whose lives were radically changed because of those 26 words. John 3.16 is actually a, a quote from Jesus. It's actually a Christmas verse. You see, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came and, you know, and there he is in the manger. He's in all of our nativity scenes we got at home. Or maybe you got a Christmas card and there's a nativity scene and there's always the little baby, right? Well, that baby ends up growing up. And when he was about 33 years old, he makes this statement. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I remember the first time that I read that and I was with a guy and he was trying to explain it to me. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and then what he did was he, he made it personal. And that's what I want to do for you. I want to make this a little, little, little personal. Let me read it again. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that if you would believe in him, you wouldn't perish but you would spend your eternity with God forever in, in heaven. And here's what I wanna do, just, just, just real, real quickly. I just wanna answer maybe three important questions. And the first one is this, why does God love you? Here's this most famous verse in all of the Bible, John 6, 316, Jesus says, for God so loves the world. God so loves you. And the question that everybody ought to wrestle around with is this. Why does God love you? Why does God love us? I, I wrestled with that because I knew me. I knew some of the things that rattled around in my mind. I, I knew some of the things that I, was, that I had participated in. Why would God love me? Why would God love you? What's the point of that? Well, in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, in the very first chapter, we, we find out why God loves you, why God loves me. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are together, and they're, they're having a conversation with, with one another, and it says this, let us make human beings in our image and in our likeness. And let them, human beings, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the tame animals, over all the earth and over all the small crawling animals on the earth. So God created human beings in his image. Beloved, we as human beings are made in the very image of God. 
God created everything. He created beetles and, and snails and worms. He created, you know, whales and dolphins. He created porcupines. He created your dog, your cat. He created, you know, hawks and eagles. He created, you know, this poinsettia down here. But this poinsettia, hawks and eagles and all of those things aren't created in the image of God. They're created by God. Only you, only human beings are created in the very image of God. It's what makes human life different than all other life. It's what gives um, our lives dignity. It's what gives our life sanctity. Is that we're made in the very image of God. Mary, who uh, the Holy Spirit came upon her, she has the Son of God, Jesus, born in a manger. Eventually, she and Joseph have a child of their own. So Jesus had a half-brother. His name was James. And James wrote one of the books in the Bible, Jesus' half-brother. And this is what he said. He said, and we, out of all of creation, became his prized possession. Yes, God created everything, but it's human beings that are made in the very image of God. We're the ones that became his most prized possession. So why does God you know, love you? Why does God love me? He loves us because he's the one that created us. We're made in his very image. Now that brings me to the second question, and that's this. Why did God need to um, give us his son? Okay, I, I get it. I, I'm made in the very image of God. I, I understand that. I can kind of grasp that concept. But what's the point of the manger scene? What's the point of the nativity scene? Why did God have to come? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son? What's that about? If God loves me so much, then why did he have to give us his son? And once again, that's a great question that you ought to wrestle around with. Why? Why do we even have this time of year? Why is there a nativity scene? Why is there a baby in a manger? Why is it that that baby's gonna grow up and at the age of about 33 hang on a cross? What's the point in all of this? Well, let me explain it to you this way. When God created the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, he put them in a beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden, and he said, Adam, Eve, it's all yours as far as the eye can see. Uh, you just enjoy it all. And what God wanted was a relationship. And God said, hey, I'll, I'll meet all your needs. I'll take care of you. You're my prized possession. You're made in, in my image. And I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to worship me. I want you to love me. I, I, I want you to adore me, and, and I'll take care of all your needs. But here was the deal. God had to set it up in such a way that human beings loved God because they chose to love God. And so he gave human beings what is called a free will. Imagine if a, a robot walked up here on the platform and said, I love you, Rick Countryman. I love you. I love you, Rick Countryman. I love you. I love you, Rick Countryman. Well, here's the deal. As nice as those words are, <laughs> they're just pre-programmed words. The robot really doesn't love me. It's just, it's just you know, reciting something that was, it was programmed to do. And God didn't want a bunch of robots that just said, I love you, God, I love you. No, he wanted us to love him and worship him because we chose to love him and we chose to worship him. So in this garden, he put a tree. And he said, Adam, Eve, here's the deal. It's all yours. Enjoy it all. But just don't eat from that one. Stay away from that one. So now... Adam and Eve had a choice to make, huh? 
Am I going to follow the Lord? Am I going to follow God? Am I going to honor Him with my life? Am I going to listen to Him? Am I going to love Him to the degree that I'll obey Him? Well, the Bible says that Adam and Eve made the decision to blow God off, and they went and they ate whatever that fruit was. The Bible doesn't tell us what the fruit was. All we know is is that Adam ate that fruit. He disobeyed God. He said, God, you know what? I appreciate it all, but I'm going to do life my own way. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to honor you. I'm going to do life my way. And at that moment, when Adam ate that fruit that God said, don't eat, when he exercised his free will in that way, it it, it just caused something that was cataclysmic. It brought sin into the world. The Bible says that when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. Sin has impacted everybody's life in this room. All of your lives over in the, uh, the, the fireside room. The hundreds that are watching right now on the internet, it's impacted your life. Maybe you're listening on the radio right now. I don't care how you're hearing this. Sin has impacted all of our lives. And the worst thing that sin did was it severed the relationship between God, the creator, and his most prized possession. The Bible says for everyone has sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. The the great prophet Isaiah said this, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's paths to follow our own. In other words, the prophet says, you know what? All of us have been like like Adam. We've all, you know, said, God, I appreciate what you have to say about life. This is the path that you want me to live, but no thank you. I'm going to go live my own way. I'm going to go do my own thing. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want anybody telling me how to live. I I just kind of want to make up my own rules. Proverbs says this, who can say I've kept my heart pure and I'm clean and without sin? (laughs) The answer is nobody, right? We all have done things we know are wrong. We've all said things that we know are wrong. We all have uh, uh, regrets, right? We all have guilty consciences at, at some moment or another. In fact, let me tell you, your conscience is a gift to you from God. You see, what a conscience is, is it tells you when you've done something wrong. It reminds you of sin in your life. That's the point of a conscience, is to let you know you've done something wrong. But here's the the, the thing that's kind of amazing that I thought about. Sin has so impacted some of your lives, you don't even believe in God. You don't even believe that there was a creator out there who created you. You, you, you believe, I don't know, two molecules got together a billion years ago and, and you're just educated goo. You're just a little higher up the evolutionary chain than a monkey. And I'm here to tell you, you're not. You were created in the very image of God. You're special, you're unique. And the Bible says that God loves you because of that. He loves you in a very unique way. But sin has just so goofed everything up that you don't even believe in him, some of you. And how I know that is while you were in here, I went to some of the the entrances and I could see skid marks all the way in, you know. (laughs) Some of you are here because you're, you know, mom drug you here, your, you know, wife drug you here, your husband drug you here, your parents drug you. You don't really want to be here. Now, you've been kind, you've been polite, the music hasn't been that bad, you know, this isn't so bad, and you're gutting out the preacher, you know. But you don't even believe. You don't believe in this God who loves you deeply because you were made in his image. You think you're a happenstance of nature. You think you're just a coincidence, a chance meeting of a couple of molecules a billion years ago. And you're not. You're not. And here's the thing. The, the, the great prophet Isaiah went on to say this. He said, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sin, he has turned away and he won't listen anymore. Sin has just so messed up everything. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking to yourself, man, this is a bummer. 
Man, I came to this celebration, you got all these pretty lights up and pretty trees up, and man, all you're doing is talking about, you know, this crummy thing called sin, and, and here's the deal. If you're a part of this family, one of the things that I always remind our people of is this, is that there's a very dark side to Christmas. Uh, uh, you know, there's another side to all of the lights and the trees and the wreaths and the pretty cards we all get and the presents and, and the nativity scenes. There's a dark side to it all. There's a reason why the baby comes. There's a reason why the baby grows up and dies. And it's because of sin. God so loved you and he so wants to have a relationship with you, but sin has severed that relationship. And so he sent his one and only son to come and deal with the issue of sin. Look, if you don't understand the dark side of Christmas, I'm not, I'm not sure you can really understand the, the glory of it all. If you don't understand the bad news, in other words, then, then the good news doesn't mean anything. And so it would be really tragic if you came here to this beautiful thing and, and you, you didn't hear the bad news because the bad news kind of makes the good news look good. Does that make sense? The Bible says this, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The Bible doesn't say today in the town of David a lawyer has been born to you. The Bible doesn't say today in the town of David a, a real estate agent has been born for you. The Bible doesn't say today in the town of David a therapist has been born for you. It doesn't say that a preacher has been born for you. And the reason why it doesn't say that is we didn't need a lawyer. We didn't need a therapist. We didn't need a real estate agent. The last thing we needed was another preacher. What we needed was a savior. A savior would be the one who could remedy the problem of sin. Matthew chapter one says, she, Mary, will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God, God knew what we needed. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. He knew what we needed. We needed a, a savior, somebody that would deal with our sins. The Bible says, for the son of man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. We were lost. Some of you are just so lost, you don't even know God. So lost, at least that's how lost I was. Just didn't even believe in him. The Bible says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world, why? To save sinners. There's a reason why you've got that baby. That baby came with a purpose. And that purpose was that God loved us so much that he was gonna be the one who remedied the problem of sin, you see? See, imagine this. Heaven is this perfect place. And so, how in the world could any of us go there? Because if any of us showed up in heaven, this perfect place, as soon as we got there, heaven wouldn't be perfect anymore, would it? In fact, if God just took this group up to heaven right now, guess what? In about 20 seconds, heaven would be as goofed up as planet Earth is. You see, the thing that has messed up our, our planet is sin. It's sin. And there's no way that God's going to allow us, these crummy, sinful people, to go into heaven. But here's the deal. There came a moment a lot of years ago when I recognized my sin had separated me from God, and I invited the Savior into my life. I invited Jesus Christ into my life, and Jesus Christ is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. And as soon as I invited Jesus Christ into my life, the Savior, the Messiah... God now looks down from heaven and he no longer sees my sin. Now I got a lot of it. My wife's running around here right now serving cookies and she can tell you about all my sin. She's very much acquainted with it. But God looks down and what he sees is his son in my life. And the glory of God's son trumps all my sin. 
the, the, the brightness of, 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 of Jesus Christ dims out the darkness of sin. And so now God can say, hey, Rick, come, spend your eternity with me. Not because of anything I've done. <laughs> I couldn't do anything to save myself. But it's because of what Jesus did, which is why everything we do around here, it's all about Jesus. We're always hip, hip, and hooray in Jesus because we understand that, that he's the one. So, so why did God need to give us his one and only son? Well, to make it possible to have your sins forgiven and restore the relationship. And here's the last question. I'll end with this. What's my responsibility to fix the broken relationship? Okay, pastor, I, I get it. God loves me because I was created by him. I'm his prized possession. I understand that sin separated the relationship and so he sent his one and only son. Well, what's my responsibility? Well, those 26 words go on and it ends like this, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but that they would have eternal life, that they would spend their eternity with God forever and ever in a place called heaven. The Bible says this in John chapter one, he, that's Jesus, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. And some of you, you're here and you don't recognize him. Things haven't changed in 2,000 years. You, you don't recognize who he is. For you, Christmas has been about trees and lights and wreaths and presents and all of that, like it was for me for a lot of, for a lot of years. The Bible goes on to say he came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave those people the right to become children of God. They're, they're reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a, a birth that comes from God. You see, when you invite Christ into your life, something happens. You're not, you're not born again physically. But something happens spiritually, all of a sudden that severed relationship is restored. And you and the one who created you begin to do life together again, the way God always intended it. I'm often asked, um, hey Rick, you know there's a lot of words between these two leather bound covers, and there are. But I'm often asked, you know, what, what, what's, What's your favorite thought about Jesus? What, 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 what's something that if you could just kind of grab onto one thought or one thing he said that really just, you know, kind of, kind of grabs, grabs your heart, Rick, what would that be? And, that, and that's easy for me to answer. It would be this. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He said, I've come in order that you might have life and life in all of its fullness. Those are Jesus' words. He said, the reason why I've come is that you would have life, and not just any kind of life, but an unbelievable life, an abundant life, a life that would go on forever and ever and ever throughout all of eternity. Jesus didn't say, I've come to give you more things to do. Man, I'm, I'm glad, because i got enough to do in life. Jesus didn't say, I've come to give you a religion. A religion wasn't born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. The last thing anybody needs is a religion. A religion doesn't save anybody. God didn't send a religion. He sent his son. Jesus didn't say, I've come to give you a bunch of rules and regulations that you have to live by. <laughs> and say that. What he said was, I've come to give you a life. A life that will just blow your mind. An abundant life, a, a life today that will be so unbelievable you couldn't ever, you just couldn't dream of what it would be like, but a life that would go on forever throughout all of eternity. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking to yourself, hey, pastor, listen, man, I got a good life right now, right? In fact, some of you are thinking, I got a great life. I, 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 got, I got a beautiful home, maybe you got two homes. You got a beautiful car, you got a beautiful family, you got kids, grandkids, man, you got a great business, you got money in your 401k and all that kind of stuff. And some of you are thinking to yourself, man, I got a good life, I got a great life, preach, I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't need this life. 
Let me tell you a story. When I was a kid, my mom raised me. I was raised by a single, single mom. And um, one of the things that we ate a lot of, she, she didn't have a lot of money, but um, she would always cook up these things. She called them tube steaks. They were hot dogs. <laughs> and uh, we ate a lot of those. And here's the deal. I loved a tube steak. I loved hot dogs. I couldn't get enough of hot dogs. I thought hot dogs were the greatest thing, you know, on the planet. But I remember one time I went to a, a, a barbecue. I was a little bit older. And there was a guy, and on the barbecue he had this flat thing. And it had this bone in the middle of it that was shaped like a T. And I said, hey, what's that? And the guy said, well, it's a T-bone. T-bone. And I ate T-bone for the first time. Yes! Man, all of a sudden, the, the, the tube steak went out the window. Who'd want to eat a tube steak when you got a steak with a T in it? I mean, that was unbelievable. <laughs> but I remember the first time I saw this round thing called a filet mignon. Hey, what's that? That's a filet. And I remember the first time I ate a filet, it was like, whoa. Who in the world would ever want to eat a piece of meat with a bone in it, man? This! <laughs> This is what I'm talking about right here. This is unbelievable. And then some genius went, man, watch me improve on this. And then they started wrapping the thing in bacon. Oh! <laughs> hey, my point is, is this. Hey, maybe you've got a tube steak and you don't realize there's something better. Maybe you've got a T-bone and you don't realize there's something better. Maybe you've got a filet and you just don't realize there's something better. Look, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you surrender yourself to the very one who created you, and you know that your sins have been forgiven, and you know that you, when you take your last breath here on planet Earth, your next one's going to be in glory with Him, when, when you reestablish the relationship that God always wanted to have with you, let me tell you something. I don't care how many houses you have. I don't care how much money you got in your 401k. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like knowing your God, your Savior. There's nothing like allowing Him to guide your life. I'm going to tell you something. That's an unbelievable life. That's like going from a tube steak to whatever. And that's what He offers you right now. I don't think it's any coincidence that you're here. I think God brought you here for a purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but they would have eternal life. And I just believe that there are some of you here like there have been in every hour who, who want that life. God has opened your eyes up to the truth. And so just close your eyes for just a moment, all of you. Just close your eyes. Over in the, the, the fireside room, close your eyes. And this is what I want you to do. I believe there's one or two or ten of you in here and you're going, man, I, I, I get it. I understand who the Messiah is. I understand what Christmas is about. I, I, I think I, I, I get this. I'm God's prized possession, but I, I haven't known him. I've never surrendered my life to him. My sin separated me from him. I, I need the Messiah. I know that's happening in some of your lives right now, just like it happened in mine decades ago. And this is all I want you to do. Do you want to receive Christ as your Savior? Just pray this prayer, just in your heart. Prayer's not in the Bible. I'm just going to make it up. But you've got to believe it. You've got to believe this prayer. Just say, Dear Jesus, I get it. I understand the story. You created me. And my sin separated me from you. And you came as the Savior. You came to forgive my sin. You came to reestablish my relationship with the Father. And right now, I invite you into my life, Jesus. 
I receive you into my life. I'm humbling myself before you right now, Jesus. I understand that you're God and I'm not. And I'm giving you my life right now. My life is yours. Help me, Jesus, to learn more about you. Help me to learn more about how I can live a life that honors you. Now, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed or whatever, if you prayed that, would you, would you do me a favor? Just, just stick your hand in the air, and the lights are kind of crazy, so I can't see very well, but I just want to rejoice with you, and I'll start over in this section here. Anybody, just raise your hand and just indicate, yeah, I got your way back there. Cool. Anybody over here? Anybody up there? Yeah, way in the very back. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I see a little guy right there, right in the front here. Cool. How about up in the mezzanine? How about over here? Yeah, I see a little guy. Yeah, I got you, ma'am. How about over here in this section? Anybody? Yeah, a whole bunch of you right back over here. Anybody up there? Yeah, a bunch of you. I'm sure there were probably some over in the, the venue, maybe some online. This is what I want you to do. Everybody look up here real quick. The, uh, they're going to sing one more song for you. It's probably my favorite song. And, and I want you to take that uh, Connect card that, that Pastor Bobby had you fill out. And I want everybody to hold that thing. And you got it in your hand. And there were lots of hands that went up. And this is what I want you to do. If you pray, will you put a little star up in the corner? And uh, those are all going to be turned in here in a moment. And before I leave here today, I'll have all those cards. And I've got well over 100 in my office already. And uh, I just want to rejoice with you. I want to be praying for you. And, and I guarantee you, you know, Monday I'm not going to show up at your door. Hey, you put a star in the card. Here I am. Preacher's at your door. Let me in. Give me some cookies. You know, <laughs> I won't do that. But I do want to rejoice with you. And what I'd like to do is maybe send you an email. Or if you don't have an email address, I'll send you something, snail mail or whatever. I just, just want to rejoice with you. And I want to invite you to this thing that I do in January called the follow class. And I do it every year. It's on Wednesday nights, and, and it begins on January uh, 7th. And it's just right over here in the fireside room. And I'll send you a little card and reminding you of it. There's child care, there's coffee. It's really cool vibe in there. You get to ask a lot of questions. I get to meet you. And there's always a, a it's just really great. And it really is the first step in learning more about this savior you just invited into your life. Look, I've been studying the Bible for 30 years and the more I study it, the more I realize how little I really know about God. And I want to help you get on the right track. And so I want you to give up a few Wednesday nights and come to, to the class. And if you really understand sin and its impact on your life and you really understand who Jesus is, you know what? You'll do whatever you got to do to, to be there. Now, some of you, you know, you made an emotional decision and you, you won't be there. <laughs> just, you, by the time you get to lunch today, you'll, you'll forget about it because it just wasn't genuine. But there will be a number of you or you'll go, wow, I want to be there. Now, there's also another group in here. Maybe you gave your life to Christ last week here at Big Valley, or last month, uh, uh, you know, six months ago, and you're going, man, I want to come to that. All you have to do is just put a little box up on the top of the card, and that lets me know you'd like to be there, and I'll send you an invite, send you more information and all that kind of stuff, because I'd love to have you uh, there also. So you're either going to put a star up there, a box up there, or you're just going to, you know, pass in the, the, the card the way it is with, with nothing on it, okay? And so right now, just, just do that. Pass those cards to the, to the, you know, the ends of the aisle. I'm going to ask our host, hostess, or greeters to come forward, and they're going to pick those, those things up, okay? Father, thanks, Lord, for um, how you worked in some people's lives here this whole week and today especially God. I pray that as they leave this place that everybody might have a greater understanding of who you are and what this season is all about. Really grateful for this choir and orchestra and the hundreds and hundreds, a thousand volunteers that have helped make this all happen here. May they have a great, great, great uh, Sunday afternoon. Lord, I look forward to being back here on Christmas Eve worshiping with my friends here. And I pray this in your name. Amen.